This image is from the Visual 6502 project, which reverse engineered the 6502 by taking sequential die shots, whereby they etched away a small layer between the die shots. This is the Monster 6502, and this is a transistor level replica of the 6502. I want to take a different approach in this video. I want to take the simplest known computing machine, a Turing machine, and make a replica which is compatible at the instruction set level. The Turing machine was invented by Alan Turing, and it imitates what we do when we do simple arithmetic. When we divide by 2, or multiply by 2, we have a notepad that we write results on, and we have a rule book in our head that tells us how to manipulate the numbers. In a previous video, I showed some simple C code for doing this. Then I showed how this simple inner loop can also be used to play Apple II Pac-Man. This code was run on a desktop PC, so we had x86 instructions, which were executed on the main CPU. These instructions came from compiling my source code for the Turing machine. The Turing machine emulated a 6502 microprocessor, and that in turn played the Apple II Pac-Man. But emulating a simple processor like the 6502 on a much more complex processor like a modern x86 doesn't prove as much as emulating it on a far simpler computer, like an elementary Turing machine. The first thing I'm going to do is take the Turing machine code and implement this data structure here, the rulebook, which corresponds to this part of the circuit. I'm going to use chips called EPROMs, Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memories, to store the data in the rulebook. This chip, the 27C4001, is a 4 megabit EEPROM, and it's interchangeable with the 27C040 chip. Let me briefly go over the background for computer memory chips. The memory is a bit like this set of pigeonholes containing different coloured rubber ducks. The first thing we need to do is number the pigeonholes, and in computer science we generally start at zero for computer memory. The data that's stored in the memory is actually encoded by the colour of the rubber duck. Black equals zero, dark blue equals one, and so forth, all the way down to white, which equals eight. You can think of these pigeonholes as being a metaphor for what's actually stored inside the chip. How do we get access to this information? Well, the chip has some address pins, and this tells it which pigeonhole we're interested in. Then it has some data pins, which tells us the colour of the duck at that address. A limitation of this type of memory is that we can only look at one pigeonhole at a time. We feed the pigeonhole number in through the address pins, and then the chip tells us the colour of the duck stored at that location through the data pins. Now we don't actually use coloured ducks, both the address and the data are in the form of a binary number. So this may actually be a better representation of what's going on. To expand the capacity of our memory, we often want to couple multiple chips together. The first way is by expanding the width of the data bus. We connect all the corresponding address pins together and all the control wires together. Then three 512K by 8-bit chips become a single 512K by 24-bit memory. The other way to couple these chips together is to expand the address space. Here, all of the corresponding address lines and corresponding data lines are tied together, but the new address lines, A19 and A20 in this case, are fed into some sort of selector chip that only activates one of the memory chips at a time. For the first 512K, the top chip selected, from 512K to 1 megabyte, the middle chip selected, then from 1 megabyte to 1.5 megabytes, the bottom chip selected. This means that our three 512K byte chips now form a 1.5 megabyte memory. The Apple II actually employed both of these strategies. It used 16K by 1 bit chips. First, it widened the data bus by combining eight of these chips together. This made a 16K byte memory. Then it used three of these 16K byte memories to expand the memory space up to 48K. In this build, I need the rulebook to be wide, but not particularly deep. In fact, I only use about 64K of the 512K available in each chip, but I want this rulebook to simultaneously output the next rule, the right symbol, and the direction to move on the notepad. This is at least 17 bits. 
and you don't have to worry, I'll find something useful to do with the remaining 7 bits. I'll go over this in a bit more detail later in the video. I use KiCad for my schematic capture. I'll leave a link below so you can download this schematic and have a look at it in more detail yourself. At the moment, I'm just placing the EEPROM and an output octal flip-flop, which I'll go over in a minute. I connect up power and ground and just get everything the way I want it. Now, the nice thing about using this sort of software is that once I'm done, I can copy and paste it. And in this case, I want three instances of this unit. I'm going to do the build on breadboards, which are these molded pieces of plastic with holes in them. The holes are set at a tenth of an inch apart, which matches the spacing between the pins on all of our chips. There are little metal pins behind each hole, and these pins are connected to form this wiring pattern. The boards come with an adhesive on the back, and they're designed to be clicked together so we can connect multiple boards together. Here I've connected seven boards together, and I'm going to lay them onto a normal kitchen cutting board. Now I can start laying down these chips on the breadboard. You might note that I've put these EEPROMs across the power rails for the breadboard rather than in the middle, where the chips normally go. You'll see I've placed these 20 pin dips in the normal position. The reason I've done this will hopefully become apparent very soon. I need to connect all the address lines for these chips together. That is, I need to connect A0 to A0, A1 to A1, and so forth. I'm going to make all the connections for one EEPROM first. And then when I'm done, I just copy and paste it to the other two. Then, rather than connecting each wire, I can just hook them all up to a bus, which is this thick blue wire. I just have to label it appropriately. Unfortunately, I can't just cut and paste with the wiring. Now, here's the advantage of placing the EEPROMs across the power signals. This gives me seven holes per pin to connect wires. It means I can create these relatively wide buses that sit flush with the breadboard. I need to ground, output enable, and chip select for all of the EEPROMs. Now I can connect up the remaining eight address lines on the right hand side of the EEPROM. I've already placed these chips on the board, but now I want to go over their function. These chips are called octal D type flip flops. They have eight input wires and eight output wires and they essentially act like a single pigeonhole from the memory we saw before. In reality, they store an 8-bit byte rather than a rubber duck. But I want to stick with the ducks for a moment just to illustrate a point. The output wires reflect what's stored inside, and generally, any information presented on the input wires is just ignored. However, the chip does have a clock pin, and on the positive edge of clock, the information stored internally is updated with what's presented on the input pins. This strictly only occurs on the positive edge of clock. Let's look at that again. And one more time. Now I'm going to do something tricky. I'm going to connect the output from my memory up to the input of my Octal D type flip flop. This is pretty straightforward, but I'm going to do it for all of my EEPROMs. This is pretty easy to do in KiCad. I just lay one wire and then press the insert key to repeat it. Unfortunately, there's no equivalent in the real world, so I just have to bend and lay each wire independently. It's actually pretty straightforward, except for the three data pins on the left hand side of the chip. The wires all get grouped up and kind of form a little bus of their own. Remember, the duck color is just a form of data. And with that in mind, I'm going to do something even trickier. Remember that in KiCad, I use a thick blue line to represent a bus, which is just a collection of wires. Here's the tricky bit. I connect the output of my flip-flops back up to the address inputs of my EEPROM. This allows me to store a sequence of numbers. Here we see the zero going back to the input. We look up pigeonhole zero. Then this new red duck is sent to the flip flops, and on the positive edge of clock, it's latched internally. This time we output a two. We look up location two in our pigeonholes, and this stores a pink duck, which represents the value six. 
on the next positive edge of clock, we store this 6 in our flip-flops, and this 6 gets reflected on the outputs and fed back to the memory. So what you'll hopefully see is that we progress through the values of 0, 2, 6, 3, 8, and 0. This sequence should just keep repeating until the power is turned off. We can see this feedback loop here. The value of rule is used as an index into our lookup table to generate the next value of rule. It might be worth stopping for a moment to think about this. Note that we index our memory with both rule and symbol. This means our address should compose of both the rule and the symbol value read off the notepad. Our EEPROM represents this rulebook data structure, which is an array storing three pieces of information at each location. The next rule, the value to write on the notepad, and the direction to move after the write. That means, in addition to the rule, we want the write symbol and the direction to also come out of our memory and flip-flops. This rather unusual looking diagram actually represents the rulebook quite well. This is probably a more traditional way of drawing that. In computer science, this is known as a finite state automata or a finite state machine. I need to connect the output of these octal D type flip flops back up to the input address of the EEPROMs. In case you're wondering, they're called octal D type flip flops because they contain eight flip flops internally. The chip itself has one reset and one clock signal, and these are connected up internally to all eight flip flops. All right, that's done. Now let's get to building it. You may have wondered why I put the address bus on the left hand side of the board so far away from the chips. Well, this is the main reason here. I wanted to leave myself enough space to hook up the inputs to these address lines. On the right side of the EEPROM though, I wanted to keep the bus as close to the chip as I could. This also gives me space to hook up these address lines without crossing the bus. In this video, we've done about half the build, and in the next video, we'll hopefully get most if not all of the remaining half of the build done. So don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for the next part.